Grab your Bibles if you haven't. And turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We've had kind of a wild start to the year between weather canceling one of our Sundays and me being sick. and We've had some guest speakers. I feel kind of like out of my routine. You know, every eight days I'm here on Sunday talking to you, opening scripture, and lately you've been, we've had other people. And I hope you enjoyed our last couple weeks when we had missionaries like Casey, um, Casey and Liz Bratcher here with us, or we had Chris Giesecke here with us, and last week, <clears throat> last week we had Darren Gillespie and his wife with us, trying to expose you to leaders that are doing unique things for Jesus, in Jesus' name, with his help, with his strength. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, but I just want you to know it feels really good to be back with you, opening scripture with you this morning, and I believe God has something very special uh, to say to us um, as we dig in to scripture together. And we're spending some time this morning on Family Sunday to check our framework. That is to check kind of we're digging into some foundational things about what it means to follow Jesus. You know, the truth is, uh, the Bible is about uh, maybe 1,900 years old. Do you know what that means? It means there's nothing new in this book. It means that if somebody stands in front of you and tries to tell you that they've got something new in the Bible you should probably not listen to the next thing that comes out of their mouth, right? God wrote this book through mankind in a special, unique way to lead us through every season of our lives. But it's not new. One of our challenges is, as pastors, as leaders, as parents, is we have to constantly find new ways to talk about timeless truths that are in Scripture. Do you agree? Yep. And what I mean by that is this. What worked uh, from a ministry standpoint to reach our great-grandparents is probably not the way you and I grew up doing church. Mm-hmm. And maybe the illustrations that are used um, over the years, over the centuries, to talk about kingdom truths, those constantly change, don't they? Nobody was using an illustration about maybe a car or media 150 years ago, right? But today, uh, media drives so many parts of our lives. So one of the things that our job is, as Jesus followers, is to learn to have new conversations about timeless truths. And that's one of the things that we're doing this morning. As we dig into some of the bedrock, the foundation of what we believe and why it's important It's also good for us to do something that I try to do regularly as a pastor, and it's this. I try to demystify and explain churchy language. How many of you know what I mean by that? What I mean by that is this. Maybe somebody who's new to the church, if we try to talk about being washed in the blood, that sounds weird, right? Doesn't it? Or maybe we use some other words like propitiation or sanctification. Uh, we use some language that we're, maybe if you grew up in church, you might know what that's talking about. But if you didn't grow up in church, you might as well be talking to a doctor on the floor of the ER, right? And I love to, for us to take some moments to dig into Scripture or dig into some language and try to demystify it for us a little bit. And so this morning, we're going to do some of that. So I want you to hold your place in Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to pray um, and just invite the Holy Spirit to work. God, we thank you for days like today, where we can bring everything that we've struggled with, everything that the last few days, months, or years have loaded on us, and we find in you someone not only willing to understand, but to carry us. That you put a light burden on us and you help us carry it. As we open your word this morning, I just ask that the Holy Spirit would speak in a unique way, and that we'd be in tune with your voice, that you do great things through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's take a quick poll here. How many of you grew up rural? That means like, 
Walmart was the store in your town, maybe, maybe Pratt size or smaller. How many of you grew up in a community Pratt size or smaller? Okay, vast majority of us. How many of you are like me and your city folk and you grew up 10 minutes from everything you ever needed and living in Pratt was an adjustment? Any of those people in here? Yeah, yeah, we understand each other, don't we? We're like... Well, back home, I used to have to drive an hour where I wanted to go, and that was because of traffic. Here, I drive an hour where I want to go because that's the closest location, right? <laughs> so, we, there's a few of us who grew up in the city. Most of you grew up rural. So you're going to understand, you rural people are going to understand exactly what I'm trying to explain to you. My family, uh, when, you, when you dig into my ancestry, um, comes from... Appalachia. Now you know they come from Appalachia because I say it right. Right? I didn't say Appalachia or the Appalachians, right? It's Appalachia. My family comes specifically from what we call West Virginia. I've got all my teeth, right? Like, I'm, man, if my grandma watches this and hears that, I'm going to get a phone call. She's going to be like, that is not funny, right? So all my family, uh, especially, uh, particularly on my dad's side, for centuries comes from West Virginia. Now, West Virginia is a unique state because, it, my grandma likes to remind me, it is the only state in the Union that is entirely within the Appalachian Mountain Range. Anybody ever been to West Virginia? It's a beautiful state, wonderful state. I love it. Um, I think it's the most beautiful state in the Union. And driving through West Virginia is like buckling into a roller coaster and then mashing the gas. It is completely within the mountains. Now, now the Appalachians are not like the Rockies. They're not super steep. It's kind of more like driving through really sharply angled speed bumps that make you want to throw up, right? You, it, is, it is really intense. And within West Virginia, there are a few decent-sized cities. Maybe places like Charleston, or Huntington, or Parkersburg, or Morgantown, or Clarksburg. And dispersed between all of these cities, do you know what exists? They're called hollers. That's the term for it. They're called hollers. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say holler? A holler is, in essence, an Appalachian, very rural neighborhood. And when I say very rural neighborhood, I mean a lot of hollers in West Virginia have a one-way dirt road, and everybody who lives on that road knows if you're a stranger coming down that road. <laughs> it's that hard to get to some of these neighborhoods. So maybe if you're driving down the highway, and you're kind of coasting up and down, and you're like, I'm going to throw up, and the, and the other person in your car is like, you can't, the bucket's already full, right? Like, <laughs> It's just that kind of intense of a drive. If you're driving through the interstate in West Virginia and you look on either side of the highway, what you see on, on these kind of steep mountains, they're not super tall, but they're pretty steep, what you see are neighborhoods. And the first thing you think when you see that house is, how in the world do people get there? How do they get there? And how do those people get out of there, Right? It's wild the way that these people live on these roads. And a couple of times I've been through some of these really rural roads and you kind of start to get nervous and you look at the dash of your rental car and you're like, does this thing have four-wheel drive? Because I'm pretty sure we're going to need it to get out of here, right? Like, I don't want to just disappear in the holler in West Virginia. These roads are very kind of tricky and, they're, and they get really um, kind of sharp corners to them. And if somebody's coming the other way, well, you know, it's like a movable object meets unstoppable force. Like somebody's going to have to back up and make room for you to get in or to get out. Now, contrast that with where I grew up. Major interstate, I-10 running right through our city. Sometimes eight lanes. City streets that are six or seven lanes wide. City streets that you don't dare try to jaywalk across because you won't survive, right? Like, just take the ten steps to the light. I promise you'll save your own life by doing that. Roads that are really wide. Roads that, that have stoplights that if you get caught at that light, 
you might as well take a nap. You're going to sit there for a while. Any city people know what I'm talking about, right? Sammy and I grew up very different this way. She grew up in a very rural community. My grade school had more kids than her town had. And so I remember, I remember the night before we got married, Sammy's grandma, Grandma Rose, was an absolute saint. And me and all of my groomsmen were staying at her house um, the night before we got married. It's an old farmhouse, still standing, um, it, super cool house. And I had driven the 10 miles or so into town to see Sammy one more time before we got married. And then I had to drive back out by myself. Now listen, I just want to explain something to all of you rural people. There were plenty of dangerous neighborhoods I spent time in in Tucson. Man, I've had guns pointed at me. I've been in fights. I've been through all, all the hard stuff, all right? And I just want you to understand, as a city guy, nothing in my life was more frightening than trying to find my way back to that farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Where no one can hear you scream, right? <laughs> like, it's not going to happen. This animal ran across the road. I was like, that looked like uh, an apocalyptic animal from the book of Revelation. And now, like, am I seeing a vision? I just want to, God, I don't want to die before I get married, please, right? I didn't know where I was at. Like, it was a gift from God that I made it back to Sammy's house. Now, the ironic thing about dumb city guys is this. When you get to rural parts of Kansas, it's all a grid, right? Like, I just, I just got to catch the right road going north and the right road going west. I will get where I'm going. But 18, 20-year-old me was like, I'm pretty sure this is the night I die. What a bummer. Like, <laughs> two different kinds of roads. Two different kinds of roads. When we lived in Nevada... And we would maybe drive to Los Angeles or San Diego. Those were roads I was comfortable on. No cops. They don't want to pull you over. It's too busy anyway. Just go as fast as you want to go and get out of everybody else's way. Like, that was made for me, right? But man, drive down a rural road at night with no lights. Driving through a holler. It's two different kinds of roads. Two completely different kinds of roads. Amen? Matthew chapter 7 tells the story. It's actually Jesus telling a story of two different kinds of roads. And he says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, I just want to give you a tip. When it comes to reading the Bible, or when it comes to teaching the Bible, it's usually not great for us to just jump into the middle of a book, or the middle of a chapter, and not give any context. So let's give some detail to what's going on here. Jesus is wrapping up what we call the Sermon on the Mount. How many of you know what I'm talking about? comes from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It is the most often quoted sermon in existence. It's the most famous sermon that anyone ever preached. It's the best sermon that you could ever hear regarding what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He talks about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> he talks about fasting. He talks about lust and murder and divorce and revenge and forgiveness he talks about loving our enemies and giving to people in need. He talks about wealth and worry and judgment and faith. He's sitting on the side of a mountain talking to this crowd in this kind of natural amphitheater by the Sea of Galilee. And he is just explaining to them, this is what it looks like to be in my kingdom. Maybe if I use a little bit cheaper language here. This is what it means to be on my team. This is what my kingdom looks like. This is how it's different. And so often what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount is he's doing a lot of comparison. And we're going to get to that here in a minute. But it's toward the end of the message that Jesus gives to this crowd that he says these sentences that we just read. Enter through the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And notice those last few words. 
Only a few people find it. Only a few people find it. Jesus is being a good pastor here. There are so many moments in the Sermon on the Mount where he paints a picture of contrast. And if you've read it, maybe you know. So when he talks about murder, he says, hey, you guys are used to this tradition that says don't kill people. Good idea. But I'm going to elevate that and say don't wish you could kill someone. That's a sin too. He says, you guys are used to saying don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, if you wish you could commit adultery with someone, you're sinning that way too. So he's elevating the standard of everything that he talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you guys are used to giving, but I tell you, when you give, don't make a big deal out of it. Give secretly. You guys are used to fasting? Well, I'm telling you, don't fast the way your religious leaders fast. Fast and don't tell anybody you're fasting. Don't brag about it. He says, you're used to talking about things like an eye for an eye and get revenge. I'm telling you, if somebody slaps your face, let them slap the other cheek too. He's elevating a standard here by creating comparison. He holds up the options for his listeners and he explains why one of them honors God and the other doesn't. So it's fitting here that Jesus would offer us a big comparison of options. Do you see it? A narrow gate and a broad one. A narrow gate and a broad gate. A broad road and a tight road. The gospel route and all the others. Now we've talked about this before, but anyone in the room, can anyone tell me there's a two-word meaning that the word gospel means? What does gospel mean? Good news. Exactly right. Very simple word. It literally means good message or good news. The word we see in the New Testament, the Greek word for that, and I'm not huge on linguistics, but we're going to talk a little bit about it today. The Greek word that we see in the New Testament for gospel is euangelion. We kind of get a word like evangelist or evangelism kind of from that. Good message, good news. Its use in Jesus' day was kind of like this. If, if I was on the front lines of a battle and I saw that our guys were winning, maybe my commanding officer would tell me, J.D., go run back to the city and tell our king that we won. To which I would look at him and say, there's got to be better runners around here than me, right? And he'd say, no, just go, run. And so a, a messenger would run, and they would not stop. They would literally run as if their life depended on it. And there would be watchmen on the watchtowers of the wall, and they would gauge the news that that runner was bringing based on how he ran. So if he was walking, and maybe he was crying, and maybe he had thrown dust on his head and ripped his clothes, those messengers would come to this conclusion, we probably lost the battle. But if this guy was running as hard as he could, and he was like, yeah, man, we killed them all, right? If he's excited, and then the watchman would know he's bringing gospel. He's bringing euangelion. He's bringing good news. We call the first four opening books of the New Testament the Gospels. The good message, the good news shared by four eyewitnesses to Jesus' life and ministry. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's great that we can define this word because sometimes in the church the language we use kind of feels exclusive. So it helps you and I to know that when we say Gospel, all we're talking about is, that, is this concept. Jesus is good news for everyone who believes in him. That's what the gospel means. That's what that expression means, that Jesus is good news, period. He is not good news unless you've done really bad stuff, or good news if you're young, or good news if you're wealthy, or good news if you're married, or good news if you're single. He's just good news. He's good news. And he paints a picture of that good news by illustrating these two roads. Now that's, that's interesting. Because every illustration that we see in Scripture, and there are a lot of them, every illustration we see in Scripture, God uses on purpose. 
So it's funny because Jesus could have stood up when he's talking about the kingdom of God. He could have stood up and said, my way is a gorgeous, strong, handsome, wealthy man. And the way of the world is like a guy whose metabolism and brains and wallet and muscles and charisma all bailed on him. He could have used that illustration. He could have stood up in front of this crowd and he could have said, my way is the best meal that you could ever eat. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It satisfies you. And the other way is like eating poison. He could have used any kind of illustration that he wanted. But listen, stick with me. He didn't. He talked about two roads. And there's some good reasons why. And before we get to those reasons, I want to be real with you about what these gates and roads represent for us. Now remember, I told you, we're laying some framework here. So hopefully, I'm sharing some things with you if you've grown up in church that aren't new to you, but maybe you're hearing them in a new way. Maybe it's the first time you're hearing some of this stuff. Either way, it's good for us as a church to lay some framework. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. So let's talk about this. Jesus starts out by talking about two different gates. And I, want to, I just want to lay, some, lay the groundwork for you here. The gates represent the starting point for all people. Both the wide gate and the narrow gate represent you and I making a conscious choice to live our lives a certain way. Are you following me? Yep. To put it another way, the narrow gate describes the beginning of our journey with Jesus not the end. These different gates are not illustrating heaven and hell. They're illustrating the routes that take us there. Now I'm telling you that for this reason, because too often what happens, and we've talked about this before, someone will get baptized and they think, I'm good. I'm done. Someone will pray a prayer at church And they think, dude, I'm sealed, I'm good, I'm done, I'm set, I'm on my way to heaven. Now look, theoretically, theologically, that's true. If you make a decision to believe in Jesus and all that He says He is, your your spiritual condition has changed from being on your way to heaven, from being on your way to hell, to being on your way to heaven. However, that's incomplete, isn't it? Why? Why? Because that decision's not the end of your relationship with Jesus. It's only the beginning. That decision's not the last time you should pray. That decision's not the last time you should have a conversation with Jesus or about Jesus. It's only the beginning. And so when Jesus uses these illustrations, Christian, please be careful. This is not, these gates don't represent you and I crossing into eternity. They represent you and I choosing a route for our lives. And I want to tell you that wide gate, if you're taking notes, listen, the wide gate is the gate we enter with zero effort and no searching. In fact, it is the default gate that everyone who has ever lived walks through. Because of what we call original sin or put it another way because of our sinful nature every human being who's ever had oxygen in their lungs starts out on the wide comfortable broad easy road and we don't have to choose it we don't choose that road it's chosen for us we are sinful by nature and we've talked about that before, about how even at a young age, our kids reveal that we're, they're kind of selfish at heart, right? We're selfish. We want to meet our own needs, our own ways. That's a really good definition of sin, by the way, that you would want to meet your needs outside of the way that God wants to meet them. So you and I, we start out on the broad, wide road, in the broad, wide gate. Now listen. Listen. The wide gate is a path that feels comfortable to us. It is definitely crowded. You will not be alone. And it's not complicated. I want to try to describe what this looks like. 
the wide gate, the wide path is easily customizable for any human being that takes it. We can wear what we want. We can bring with us whatever we want. We can move at our own pace. We can get distracted with whatever we choose. And we can call that wide path whatever we want to call it. In today's world, in today's culture, people call that wide path things like this. I'm just living my truth. Which is the silliest expression. There is no such thing as your truth. There is the truth. Amen? But the wide road is full of people who say, dude, I'm just living my truth. What I believe about heaven and eternity doesn't have to be true for you. In which I think, holy cow. I mean, yeah, I guess that's kind of true, but there's still only two choices, right? So it may not be true to you, but if it's not true to you and I believe in Jesus, there's only one other option for you. That we People who walk the wide road say things like, this is what works for me, or this is my personal life philosophy, or I don't really think about eternity, or I think God likes me enough to accept me and listen to me, friends. And like I said, we're laying groundwork here. The wide road welcomes you and I to define it for ourselves, and it doesn't care what you call it. The person who paved the wide road for you, the enemy of your soul, doesn't care if you believe in him or not. He doesn't care if you call yourself a Christian. He doesn't care if you live for any kind of addiction there is in this world. He's happy with you choosing whichever one you're most comfortable with. The wide road welcomes us to define it for ourselves. The devil's just happy that you're on it. He would prefer that you not pay attention to this question. Are there any other roads to take? Ah, don't worry about that. The one you're on is comfortable. There's a whole lot of people you know on it. You can do whatever you want. Just keep walking is what the enemy says to you. Now let's talk about the narrow gate. The narrow gate is the holler. (laughs) The narrow gate is that road I talked about driving on the night before we got married. It may not be smooth like a paved road. Maybe it's rained and there's some, there's some ruts kind of showing up on this muddy road, right? Maybe you've got to stop and put it into four-wheel low if you're in your truck. The narrow road is one that is not smooth. The narrow gate is not easy to find. But obviously, in Jesus' illustration, the narrow gate is His way. It is the beginning, and listen to me, friend, it is the beginning of the path of following Jesus. It is the lifelong route that leads us to walk where Jesus walks and how Jesus walks. A great pastor who died last year, his name was Tim Keller, said it this way, to follow Jesus is to live my life the way Jesus would live it if he were living it. I'm paraphrasing him a little bit. But if we're going to walk the narrow way, it is essentially this. Okay, I'm going to be a wife like Jesus would be if he was a wife. And I'm not getting heretical here. I'm not getting weird. I'm just saying we do it the way Jesus would do it if he was in our shoes. That's what we're called to do. That's what life on the narrow road looks like. It is not comfortable. Can someone say amen? Amen. You and I do not define what that road looks like. We don't get to call it what we want to call it. And walking that road, we get invited a lot to die so that we can experience real living. And I want to take a couple minutes to talk to you about why I believe Jesus uses this illustration of two roads. And we're not going to take a whole lot of time. First of all, I believe he, he talks about two roads to help us understand the intentionality involved in being a follower of Jesus. Now, this is a big deal. Where we lived in Nevada, there were cities and nothing. It's not like Kansas. If you traveled kind of west of Colorado, you understand that these states here in the Midwest are unique because if you can throw a rock far enough, you'll hit the next town, right? 
Every 30 miles or so, every 40, 50 miles, you're going to have to slow down no matter what road you're on or the local cop's going to give you a ticket because you're just hitting town after town after town. Look, you get west of Denver and the landscape changes. Have you noticed that? All of a sudden, you're like, I better get gas everywhere I see a gas station because it might be hours before I see one. You do that drive across I-15 or um, I-70 in Utah, and you just start praying, Jesus, this is the kind of place where if my car breaks down, I, I'll start thinking about um, having my last few earthly conversations with you before I see you face to face, right? Where we lived in Nevada, it was kind of like feast or famine. There were cities and then there was nothing. And occasionally in those deserts, in that vast area of nothing, there'd be a road. And here's what I'm saying. No one wound up on that road by accident. If you were all of a sudden climbing up the side of Mount Charleston, the big mountain that overlooks Las Vegas, at a 75 degree angle, you didn't get on that dirt road by accident. You weren't just traveling through bumper-to-bumper -bumper Vegas traffic and all of a sudden find yourself climbing a mountain, right? There's intentionality involved in a decision like that. And Jesus is contrasting these two roads. And He's painting a similar picture here, friend, and I want you to catch it. No one, and this is important, no one trips and falls into a life with me. Did you hear that? No one wakes up all of a sudden and they're like, dude, I have all of the fruit of the Spirit and I didn't even try. I just got it all. No one wakes, no one wakes up and says, oh my goodness, yesterday I didn't even think about praying. Now it's all I want to do. No one winds up on the narrow road by accident. There's intentionality involved in this. If you're going to walk the narrow road, you don't stumble on it. You look for it and you stick on it. And so Jesus uses this illustration of two roads to help us understand there's intentionality involved in this decision. But second of all, He uses it to underline that there's also exclusivity involved. And here's what I mean by that. There's exclusivity. Not to say that following Jesus makes you and I elite, but it is to say that it's uncommon. It's uncommon. We live in a Western nation where if my grandparents went to church, I probably call myself a Christian. <laughs> that's, a, that's the sound of Family Sunday right there. <laughs> Somebody's kid toy going off. We live in a nation where there, for all sorts of reasons, we might call ourselves Christians and wear the label even though my life doesn't look any different than somebody who doesn't wear the label. Are you hearing me? There's a certain amount of exclusivity in following Jesus. In fact, reliable research has said recently uh, these numbers that over 60% of Americans willingly, easily call themselves Christians and roughly 4% of Americans are seeking to live a life that honors Jesus according to biblical principles. Do you see the gap there? Six out of ten of us are walking around saying, I belong to Jesus. And he's looking at many of them and saying, no, you and I don't know each other. You and I don't know each other. There's an exclusivity that comes along with following Jesus. We understand this pretty easily, I think. It's about an 18-hour drive from our doorstep here in Pratt to where I grew up. Now, I have never in my life made a drive like that and thought, you know what? I'm just going to avoid all highways and interstates and rely on back roads to get where I'm going. You know why I don't do that? Because no one on earth has that much vacation time, right? <laughs> when we travel, we think about efficiency and safety and convenience. But when it comes to following Jesus, he's using the illustration of the back road. He's choosing the illustration of the uncommon route. The lonely path. Listen, Jesus knows. I want you to hear this, friend. Jesus knows how many people that He created, that He made with purpose, 
that he loves with a perfect love, he knows that there are millions, billions of them that will choose the wide path. He knows that to really bend your life around him is rare. And so he's using this illustration to make that point. Third, he's, he's talking about it in road language to emphasize that we can't bring much when we choose this route. Now that's a tough one. The narrow gate sends a message to you and I, and it's this. Don't bring a trailer, bro. Don't bring a trailer. Don't strap your luggage to the roof of your car. There's no clearance for it. If you're taking the narrow road, don't bring a bunch of stuff that you think you're going to need. Just bring yourself. There's no room for much more. I'm not going to read it to you today for time's sake, but St. Augustine who wrote about 1,600 years ago, just a few hundred years after Jesus died on the cross. He talks about this portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 7. And he talks about how the reason why so few people find the narrow road is because they're all trying to enter it and bring something with them. Hey, I want to choose the narrow road, but I want to bring with me my pet sins. And Jesus says, well, we don't do that. Well, I want to bring with me my pride in my good deeds. And Jesus says, I don't do that either. You can't bring that. I want to bring my feeling of earning this. I want to bring this thing or that thing with me. Augustine reminds us that Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we want to bring those good deeds and our bragging rights and our efforts and our pride and our sin. We want to bring that with us. But Jesus uses the narrow road to underscore reality for us, friends. There's not room on the narrow road for you to bring anything but yourself. Don't bring your reputation. Jesus will make you put it down. Don't try to bring your sin because he's going to talk to you about it the whole way. Don't try to bring your pride. Now look, we learn how to lay our sin down, right? Like, I mean, I, I want to I be clear about that. It's not that we choose to follow Jesus and never struggle again. I think maybe the better way for me to say it is, don't plan on keeping what you brought. The last thing is this. I believe Jesus chose a road to remind us that nothing is a guarantee. Whichever road we're on, we can turn around. Anybody ever known someone who served Jesus for a long time only to give up on him? Is that not one of the strangest things in the world when we see it happen? I mean, we love these stories of the opposite, right? Someone who just lived for themselves for 40, 50, 60 years, and then all of a sudden, the things happen just right. They begin to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and they switch roads. They hop off the wide, comfortable path, and they kind of bust through the narrow gate and they're like, I'm here and I'm not going back that way. But I want you to understand that happens both ways. There are people in our lives, there are people we've, I've baptized in this church on this stage right here who changed their mind. There are people in your story who at one point you were sure loved Jesus with everything they had that changed their minds. And I think Jesus uses this illustration about two roads to remind us of something. We have to keep making the decision every single day of our lives to stay on the narrow road. Because man, sometimes there are elements of that wide, broad, smooth, comfortable road that look nice, right? I mean, we see people in the church right now that are giving in to elements of the wide road. People that are bending the meaning and application of Scripture to fit some wide road ideas. It's happening again and again and again. Why? Because we look at the wide road where people all look happy doing whatever they want to do. And we think, the church, surely Jesus loves people enough to, to say that, well, yeah, He's probably cool with with you being gay. He's cool with that. You don't have to change that. We'll make room for that. Well, he's probably cool with you not really believing that this is absolutely his word. He's probably cool with that. He loves you enough. 
And he's probably cool with if you love God, but you call him something else. Or maybe you read a different book. He's probably cool with that too. Look, friend, he's not. He's not. He's not. Does he love all of us? Absolutely, without question. It doesn't matter how dark and black and awful your story is. But love and acceptance are not the same. Amen? Amen. So you and I have to choose in our lives every single day to wake up and say, God, I'm staying on the narrow road with you. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I don't look sometimes over the hedge and wonder what's going on on that wide road. But I want you to plant my feet on the only route I know that leads to Jesus. I want to stick on the narrow road. Jesus is using this illustration with this kind of intentionality. I don't want you to ever read this the same again without thinking about why he would talk this way on purpose. He's using this language to help us grasp an important truth. We must make a choice. And even by not making a choice, we're making one. If we've been on the broad road, we're not stuck there. Amen? Amen. Anybody been on the, lived on the broad road for a long time before you chose Jesus? Anybody in here who's like, well, maybe I wasn't on that road for a long time, but it was pitch black when I decided to leave it. It was really bad, right? We celebrate the fact that we're not there anymore. Amen? Amen. But we still have to wake up every day and say, God, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. So Jesus uses this picture of of two roads to emphasize something important for us. And I know we're hammering some foundational things here this morning, but I'm going to do it again for you here, okay? He's saying this, and I believe he's talking to the church here. Don't just hear my word. Don't just like me. Don't just cheer me on. Don't just appreciate me. Don't just talk about me. I'm inviting you to follow me. To follow me. Now, I use those words very specifically because every single thing on this list, there are people in our churches who are doing this every single week except the last one. Did you hear that? There are people in this room who hear God's word every week. They like what they hear about Jesus. They cheer Him on when He answers someone's prayers. They appreciate Him. But they are not following Him. There have been seasons in my life, I'm embarrassed to say, that I wore the name of Jesus, but I did not feel like following Him. That's not an option that He gives us, friends. The road is Jesus' way to describe a journey, a process, a lifelong commitment to learning how to live a certain way. And that's important because we tend to treat this like it's a decision. We talk, we talk about things, we maybe hear people talk about things like this. Well, I, I, mean, I, I prayed to receive Jesus at seven years old. I think I'm good. Or I grew up in church. I'm sure he's cool with me. Or I got baptized when I was in youth group. We associate choosing the narrow way with things like that, but that's not what he meant. Nowhere in his word does it say that following Jesus means make one decision, say one prayer, get baptized, attend church, be raised by Christian parents, give money to your church, or go to youth group. None of that stuff means I'm a follower. Also, none of that stuff is bad. None of that stuff is bad. If you've done every single thing on that list, I'm not talking to you to criticize you about that. I'm simply giving you a warning. None of those things equal I'm following Jesus with my whole heart. You hearing me? We don't choose the narrow way once and then speed down the path and wait at the end of the road until we die waiting for Jesus to catch up. We follow Him. Jesus, when Jesus said narrow is the road and only a few find it, I believe he was thinking about these words from Matthew chapter 16. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You know what's unique about that language? He told them to take up the symbol of execution and death before he wore it. 
Now, we get to read this in benefit of hindsight. So he mentions the cross, and we're like, of course, Jesus and the cross. The first time he says this, they're like, dude, why is he talking about a symbol of execution here? That's not, that's not how this works. And Jesus is saying, no, that's exactly how this works. Every day you wake up and you take this symbol of your death and say, what do I die to today? Jesus doesn't come along on your story. He doesn't tag along. He doesn't sponsor you. He doesn't pay a bit of money to put his name on your shirt so you can go live how you want with his name on it. You follow him. You carry his symbol, and his symbol's a cross. His symbol is death to self. The narrow road is about denying ourselves so we can choose the Jesus way with our relationships, our money, our health, our jobs, our role as parents, and anything else you can think of. We're not expected to not have those things. We're just expected for them to be he, he calls us to place them in submission to Him. And I want to point out a few things to you about the rest of the chapter here. Because He makes a few points about the narrow road that I want to just drive home as we begin to wrap up this morning. First of all, there's a way we can know if somebody walks the narrow road, the narrow Jesus road. Now, we live in a time and in a culture where the last thing we want to be known for is what? Judging somebody else, right? And we are so, Americans, we are so afraid that somebody would think that we think what they're doing is wrong. It's pretty silly. Most of the world is like, I'm cool with telling you, you're wrong, and I think you should probably die for that, right? Like some people in the world, some cultures are way too pushed the other way. We are so afraid that someone's going to think, man, you're homophobic, you're Islamophobic, you're xenophobic, you're misogynist, you're whatever, you're this or that. We're so afraid of those things, and some of those things are absolutely terrible. But my whole point in saying this is there is a way for you and I to be able to look, especially at our own lives, to see if we are really on the narrow road. In verses 15 through 20, as Jesus begins to talk about false teachers, and this is where you, if you're taking notes, you'll just have to jot some passages down here because we're not going to dig into them the whole way. In verses 15 through 20 of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus goes on and he begins to talk about false teachers, people who wear his name, but they're not really following him. And look at what he says in verse 16. He says, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And he goes on in verse 20 and says, thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do you know what Jesus is saying here? It's pretty simple. Your life reflects whether you're walking the narrow road. Not just your words. Your life reflects it. Now we, in our sinful nature, you know what we get tempted to do with that? We start holding everybody else's life up to this and we're like, "Mm, I don't think he's saved. Because let's be honest, he's a jerk. And I don't think JD's saved because have you seen the way he drives, right? (laughs) (laughs) And I don't think she's saved. And I don't, you know, we, we, we try to start, we can easily start trying to do God's job. You know, the first person we need to hold that filter up to, right? It's you. It's you. What's the fruit of my life? What is the fruit of the Spirit of God in my life? Look, I don't like having to confront myself with this, but if I don't have more peace than I did last year, I'm not producing good fruit. If I don't have more love and joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, this list that we call the fruit of the Spirit from the end of a book in the New Testament called Galatians, if I'm not seeing my life grow in those areas, then something's wrong. And can I tell you, it feels terrible. And, and if, if you know what I'm saying, I need you to nod at me so I know I'm not alone. It feels terrible to have your spouse tell you, I don't really see that in you right now. Doesn't that feel great? It feels terrible to recognize that the people in your tightest circle are not seeing the fruit of the Spirit from you. 
But Jesus gives us a standard here. And one of the best things you and I can do is not to climb up and start being judge, jury, and executioner in Jesus' name. Although he certainly gives us this warning so that we will pay attention to false teachers. What's the fruit of their lives? If they're teaching you something that's not in God's word, get out of that church, get away from them, even if it's this one and even if I'm the one that's teaching it. Get away from somebody who is not living and teaching what Jesus lived and taught. But beyond all of that, friend, may we never shine his light on someone else's life before we turn it on ourselves and say, God, show me where I'm missing it. Second of all, taking the narrow road is not about our ability. It's about our proximity. Jesus says this in Matthew Uh, 7 verse 21 not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my father who's in heaven many will say to me listen to this many will say to me on that day Lord Lord did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles and then I will say to them plainly I never knew you away from me Did you catch that list that they gave him? Did you catch that? Did we not prophesy in your name? I don't know about you, but in the churches I grew up in, the people who were willing to say, thus saith the Lord, I thought those people were pretty holy, righteous people. Here, one of those people is standing before Jesus at the end of all things saying, didn't I prophesy? And Jesus is saying, yeah, you had abilities, but you and I didn't have proximity. You had ability to sound like you came from me, but you and I weren't close. Somebody else stands up and says, Jesus, didn't I cast out a demon in your name? And Jesus says, yeah, but that's because of my name, not you. Your abilities aren't going to get you into heaven. He's not going to have you and I stand up and say, well, today the standard we're using is how good did you sing on worship team? So we're going to run through all of your sour notes. And if you have too many, it's like Guitar Hero. Boom, you're out, right? (laughs) It's not about ability. It's about proximity. Look at this. After everything that these people say to him, the last thing that Jesus says to them is, but I never knew you. I never knew you. Not you didn't have the gifts that you thought you did. Not you didn't do the things that you thought you did. But yeah, you did some stuff, but you and I were never a thing. And it wasn't because I didn't want it. It's because you didn't want it. Friend, taking the narrow road is not about you and I just endlessly pouring out our gifts in this church as if God thinks that he needs them. It's about us pouring out our gifts because we are in close proximity to him and we want to love him and his church through what he's enabled us to do. Did you hear that? Lastly. Well, let me back up. Let me back up. I don't want to skip this part. The devil, the enemy of your soul, is who's paved that wide, tempting road for you and I. And he loves it if you call yourself a Christian. The devil doesn't care that you call yourself a Christian. He doesn't care one bit. He doesn't care if you wear that name. You know what he cares about? If you live like one. If you live like one. That's when he knows he's losing you. Lastly, the narrow road is the way not only to eternal life, but security in this life too. We're not going to read it, but Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount with this great illustration. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And he goes on and begins to illustrate of two houses that have to weather a storm. And one has a solid foundation, and so it weathers the difficulties that it faces without collapsing. But the other one is built on a poor foundation, and so when the storm comes, the whole thing caves in. And the illustration's pretty obvious for us, isn't it? The bedrock of your life is not that you heard good teaching. It's not that you came to church. It's that you put into practice the followership of Jesus. 
That's where your bedrock comes from. I think sometimes we misread this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. And we act like, well, if I hear it, that's like having a firm foundation. No, that's not what Jesus says. He says, if I put it into practice, I have a firm foundation. I got to put it into practice. If I don't, it does no good to me. I mean, it's great to hear Scripture. We meet Jesus usually because we've heard Scripture, but if we do not apply it to our lives, do you know how beneficial it is? Not at all. The ones who benefit from His teaching, the ones who are able to withstand the storms that He promises are coming, whether they love Him or not, are the people who put those teachings into practice. We're called to follow Jesus, not just hear about Him, not agree with what someone else says about Him, not approve of Him, not clap for Him. That's all stuff we do on Sundays. There's nothing wrong with it unless we think that this is what it looks like to follow Him because frankly, it's not. Following Him involves applying the way He told us to live to our everyday lives. And here's what's beautiful about that. Here's what is absolutely incomparable about choosing to follow Jesus. It's good news. It's good news. It's gospel. And we do well to remember what the good news is step by step. As we wrap up our time together this morning, I want to walk you very quickly through a summary of the gospel. Thank you, Alex. The gospel starts with our origin. We were created by the same God who made everything that exists, and he loves us and has the best plan for our lives. Genesis 2, John chapter 1, both spell that out. The gospel starts with our origin. But it moves on to our struggle. We have a sinful nature. That is, within you and I is a struggle of us wanting to meet our needs outside of God and go against His will. You and I sin often and sin's penalty is death. But the gospel is also about our rescue. Because even though we sin and we struggle with sin, Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus, the Son of God, God in the body of a man, left heaven, came to earth to live in our experience, to live without sin and pay the penalty that our sin deserves. Eternal death. Our origin, our struggle, our rescue, and then our gift. Jesus not only paid our penalty, He also rose from the grave. He did not just experience death on our behalf, He defeated death on our behalf. That means that sin's eternal power is broken for all who choose to follow Him. And the Gospel is also about our journey. That our lives begin to change as we follow Jesus through all of the successes and all of the failures and challenges and difficulties and blessings of life, as we live as He calls us to live, listen, friend, we find greater peace and purpose and intimacy with God than we could ever imagine. Paul describes it in Galatians 2.20 as this, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. Lastly, the Gospel has a great deal to do with our destination. Heaven, eternal life with God in the absence of sin and pain and sorrow and loss and endings. Heaven waits for all who follow Jesus. That's good news. This is the news that's worth taking the narrow road, friend. And I want to hammer, I'm just trying to hammer this home. I, I I think I've become a pastor who just chooses a few nails and just just pounds on them sometimes. If you and I do not keep our feet intentionally on the narrow road with Jesus, we will, without realizing it, find ourselves on the wide one. Remember, nobody just wakes up and happens to be righteous. It's not about earning, but it is about growing, apprenticing, training with Jesus. It doesn't happen by accident. Please, friend, please, ouch. 
please, don't misunderstand this, okay? In the Gospels, there are two kinds of people. There are people who follow Jesus with their whole heart and people who don't. We have, in our own culture, created a third option where I wear the name of Jesus and I believe in Him, but I don't follow Him with my whole heart. And you need to understand something, friend. The Bible does not, if that's you, the Bible does not make room for you. I'm not being exclusive. I'm not being rude. I'm not being unkind about that. I'm just telling you what Scripture says. There are not tiers of Christianity in Scripture. I follow Jesus with my whole heart or I don't. There's not somebody in between who's like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but man, I don't pray and I don't fast and I stink at forgiving and I don't really care about getting better with my sin, but I am a Christian. Jesus looks at those people and says, not the way that I laid it out. Not really. And so I want to encourage you this morning. I don't want you to feel sad. I don't want you to feel bummed out. I want to encourage you this morning, friend. Whatever road you're on, it's not too late to turn off. If you are on the narrow road, remind yourself, it is not too late for you to turn off. You have to keep choosing it every single day of your life. If you're on the wide road and you've been lying to yourself about it, listen, now's the time Jesus wants to talk to you. Jesus wants to have a real conversation with you, whether it's right now in this moment or on your way home or tonight when you're going to sleep. My challenge, my invitation to you, friend, is this. Do not believe something about him that is not true. Do not believe that he lets you write the standards of what it means to follow him. He's already written them. His invitation is for you to follow them. Two roads, but only one gospel. Two roads, one gospel. I want you to close your eyes with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we bring ourselves to you. And God, I, I believe that we need confronting. Not everyone but me, but starting with me, God, we, we need to be confronted by you. Confronted about the ways that we think we follow you, but maybe we really don't. Confronted about what our followership, what our apprenticeship to Jesus really looks like. Gently, lovingly encouraged to sit with the God of the universe, the one who made us and loves us, the one who authored the gospel. God, I believe you are encouraging us to sit with you and consider the road we're on and what our followership of Jesus has looked like. As some of us are lagging way behind where you'd have us go. As some of us are trying so hard to convince ourselves we're on the narrow road when maybe we're not. Now, some of us are choosing to follow you, but we're getting discouraged and we need reminded that sticking with you to the end is worth it. That being shaped by the Holy Spirit is worth it. Lord, I just pray that you would give us, every single person in this room of all ages, a distaste for the wide road. God, there are things on that road that tempt us. Things that we convince ourselves maybe you're okay with in the ways that we think or the ways that we do or don't do. Lord, I pray you'd give us a distaste for anything that's not from you. I pray you'd stir up deep within us as your church a passion, a passion, Jesus. For followership, for apprenticeship to Jesus. To walk where you walk, to do what you do, to talk like you talk, to love like you love. 
God, just make it so clear in our minds that there are two roads in one gospel. And help us wholeheartedly embrace it with everything that we've got. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to ask our board and our staff to come. Thanks for sticking with us. Kids, reach kids that are in here, you are awesome. Thanks for sticking with us today. We intentionally end our time every Sunday, pretty, pretty much every Sunday, by making room to pray with you. And so maybe you're here and you're like, man, I need to respond to this message. I need someone to pray with me. I need someone to encourage me. Now's that moment. Maybe you need prayer for something else. Maybe you're sick, someone in your family's sick, someone in your family's on the wide road, whatever that looks like. We want to invite you to come. If you've got any prayer needs, we are here for that. We also want to remind you of a prayer opportunity that we are developing for all of our staff that asking you to pray with us on a different day throughout the month. You'd be able to sign up for that out in the foyer as well. But please come if you've got any prayer needs that we can join you with. If not, we would love to see you back on Wednesday night for our prayer meeting or next Sunday. Reach Church, we love you. We love you and we believe God is doing great things in this church and in your life. And we invite you to be a part of it. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Thank you.